The holidays are basically here, which means it's the time of year we all get to sit around with those who both love us most and best know how to humiliate us. Of course, cinema has spent decades exploiting this awful combination for great entertainment. These are our picks for the 10 best film families of all time. On this list, we're going to explore different arrangements of family dynamics, starting small with a two-person dyad and working up to the enormous system of an entire familial tribe. And for our first stop, we're looking at the relationship of father and son. Often an exploration of generational masculinity, inherited expectations, rivalry, and role modeling, films like Tree of Life, Billy Elliot, Honey Boy, and The Field of Dreams all scratch these different variations of the father-son movie itch. From the wholesome and healthy dynamics of The Lion King, Life is Beautiful, Beginners, and Big Fish, to anything but in Five Easy Pieces, Beautiful Boy, and Catch Me If You Can, to those a little too complicated to classify one way or another, like Paris, Texas, The Godfather, and There Will Be Blood. We especially love East of Eden, The Bicycle Thieves, and Ozu's Floating Weeds. However, for our first pick, we're grading more on the scale of explosive potency than that of therapist-approved attachment style when we pick the fiery duo from the inimitable He Got Game. Man, what's gonna happen? That's all the play got to do to you is make you mad, huh? All you got to do is make you mad, and you'll give up, won't you? Because when you get mad, you can't play. Because when you get mad, you can't make a shot. Look at it. Oh, don't get mad. You the one time to be a good sportsman, didn't you? Ball up. Even more than half-court conflict, He Got Game explores an estrangement between a father and son. Superstar Ray Allen plays America's number one high school basketball prospect in the thralls of recruitment, while Denzel Washington, at his most delightfully prideful, plays his swaggering father, released temporarily from prison to help recruit Allen to the governor's alma mater. The two men navigate around a decade-wide gulf of resentment and entitlement as father contends with a son who has long since surpassed him. When one realizes that all their father's coaching and encouragement to become the best were just thinly veiled covers for his own smug sense of entitlement and ego gratification, how does one square it with the fact that it actually worked? What is then owed to that father? Gratitude? Hatred? Both? Lee's searing exploration is colored by his love of the game, the peak of his creativity, and a score that simply won't and shouldn't quit to culminate in one hell of an exploration of the envy embedded within the paternal dynamic. Very different from the stereotypically testosterone-fueled cinematic father-son twosome is film's father-daughter dynamic, often depicted as less competitive and more collaborative, with each bringing to the table something needed and lacking in the other, often along with a slight sense of unrequited interest in the relationship. If you're a father to a daughter, we don't recommend modeling your parenting style after those in Birdman, Steve Jobs, or, God forbid, Old Boy, but you could do a whole lot worse than those you see in 8th grade and My Neighbor Totoro, while Taken is to be reserved for only the very specialist of occasions. We love both Late Spring and An Autumn Afternoon, The Double Life of Veronique, and the weirdly hilarious Tony Erdman. But our pick has to go to the real father-daughter pairing of Ryan and Tatum O'Neill in Paper Moon. Let me explain something to you. It ain't as if you was my pa that'd be different. Well, I ain't your pa, so just get that out of your head. I don't care what those neighbor ladies said. I look like You that. don't look nothing like me. You don't look any more like me than, than you do that Coney Island. Eat that damn thing, you hear? We got the same job. Lots of people got the same job. It's possible. No, no, it ain't possible. And I want my two hundred dollars. All right. When a Depression-era con man is introduced to a nine-year-old girl who just might be his daughter, he takes advantage of the opportunity to guilt the man responsible for her mother's death into giving him $200. Of course, he doesn't want a daughter and denies any relation, to which the little girl, in true daughter of a con man form, responds by demanding that the $200 is rightfully hers. What follows is Peter Bogdanovich's endlessly delightful road film, where obviously they work together to run grifts and end up bonding in the process. And it's almost the exact opposite of He Got Game. In place of a father claiming he wants everything to do with his kid while ultimately acting from ulterior motives, instead we have one claiming to have only ulterior motives who actually just wants to hang out with his kid. And where the one irony is tragic, the other is anything but. Buoyed by a wealth of real-life father-daughter experiences to draw from, the O'Neills paint a portrait of exactly the kind of love that lies at the heart of the very best small families. 
doing away with men for a while, the on-screen mother-daughter dynamic is often one of projection, as in Black Swan or Mommy Dearest, or of the struggle to accept fundamental differences, as in Autumn Sonata, Freaky Friday, and Everything Everywhere All at Once. We find good role models in Aquila the Bee, Mamma Mia, Steel Magnolias, and Temple Grandin, and terrible ones in Carrie. Stoker, 13, and Precious. We love the dynamics in terms of Endearment, Florida Project, and Grey Gardens, but for our next pick, we have to go with the many different mother-daughter duos from Almodovar's Volver. Mi madre ha muerto. De ser será su fantasma o su espíritu. Hay lo que tú quieras, pero sácame de aquí. There is not just one, but a full three and a half mother-daughter pairs in Volver, a wonderfully melodramatic tale of a recently deceased mother, the spirit of whom begins to visit with one of her daughters, but not the other, who finds herself needing to help her daughter with an unexpected death. Volver conceives of motherhood as a role that demands an almost infinite capacity for providing care and protection, but also as one that is always forgivable upon apology when that impossible demand is not met. At the same time, it conceives of the daughter as an active accomplice in that job of providing care, and in many ways, an apprentice in a compassion that will eventually be passed forward. Pedro Almodovar's dazzlingly colorful camera is fundamentally feminist and also inescapably preoccupied with Penelope Cruz's breasts in a way that somehow isn't a contradiction. In a film with hardly a breathing male presence in it, shot by a male filmmaker, it is striking how directly it seems to engage with the idea of inherited womanhood. Rounding out the parent-child one-on-ones, our number seven pick has us making a stop at Mothers and Sons. Although there are a few dysfunctional pairings to be found here, from Moonlight, We Need to Talk About Kevin, Mommy, The Overbearing, You Were Never Really Here, and obviously Psycho, the larger portion of these cinematic combos are shown as ultimately loving, often with a sense of nostalgia and longing, as if the relationship were something precious that has since been lost. Think The Mirror. Pain and Glory, Aparagito, Weirdly, Back to the Future, Room, and our favorite film about a mother and son, 20th Century Women. I gave him beer, and then I, I taught him how to verbally seduce women, and we drove drunk, but I stopped that. And then he kissed Trish, and then we walked home. <gasps> You're not mad? You're mad. You get to see him out in the world as a person. I never will. Mike Mills followed up his semi-fictionalized ode to his father in Beginners with his semi-fictionalized ode to his mother in 20th Century Women, the story of a single mom, Annette Benning, attempting to raise her only son by proxy via the influence of the other younger women in his life, as he increasingly drifts away from her, propelled by his teenage need for independence. It is a story about a relationship at a distance, about the hurt that distance can cause alongside the inescapable need for it nonetheless, about growing apart but staying together, about irredeemable differences and our abilities to understand past them with empathy. The film envisions the mother-son relationship as one containing both unbridgeable gaps and enough love to cross them, grappling with that contradiction and all its beautiful messiness to arrive at another one of cinema's best families ever put to film. Enough of parents for a while, sometimes the thing that makes a family great is your siblings. And some of cinema's most fascinating siblings are the increasingly contentious brothers in I Wish, Good Time, Rain Man, Hell or High Water, Rocco and His Brothers, Ordet, A River Runs Through It, Raging Bull, On the Waterfront, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, and Ran. The much less contentious brother-sister pairings of Night of the Hunter, You Can Count on Me, Star Wars, Love Streams, Shame Kinda Sorta Weirdly, En Sunday, and Grave of the Firefly. Flies, or the again increasingly contentious sisterhoods of the young girls Rochefort, the Virgin Suicides, Hannah and her sisters, Martha Marcy May Marlene, Blue Jasmine, Cries and Whispers, Atonement, and whatever happened to Baby Jane. Of course, there's always room for an exception. There's little real contention to be found in the unforgettable dynamic of the five sisters in Mustang. <laughs> Sorry. 
Sanay, en büyükleri sensin. Senden başlayacağım. Denis Ergüven's film about five orphan sisters caged up and groomed for marriage in a small Turkish village gives us a family of nothing but sisters. Their parents are gone, and they're more guarded than cared for by their extended family. The only real bonds to be seen are those of sisterhood. And what a sisterhood it is. Energetic and youthful and alive and spirited, at times clearly made up of five separate and distinct entities, at others more like a singular symbiotic organism that just happens to exist within five different bodies. And Ergüven is masterful in her ability to create authentic moments within that dynamic and then use the camera to fold us into them, as if we too belonged to that multi-headed creature that is their family. And just as soon as we begin to feel like we're a part of it, the surrounding world sets in to break it down and sell it off for parts, and we feel, with all the rest of the girls, exactly how devastating that is. Stepping up to the three-person family, most often two parents and only one child, but not always. To Kill a Mockingbird, we're looking at you. Films about families of this size start to explore the complexities of triangulation, how individual relationships can be interdependent in a family unit, how the destabilization of one leg of a stool can topple the whole thing, as in The Shining, American Beauty, and Kajillionaire, or how the stability of one relationship can serve as a stabilizing foundation for a struggling third, as in Lady Bird or Inside out. But for this slot, we're most fascinated by those films exploring family triangles breaking apart, as in a separation, a marriage story, and our next pick, Kramer vs. Kramer. Daddy. Now what is it? Are you going away? No. I'm staying right here with you. You're not going to get rid of me that easy. That's where mommy left, isn't it? Because I was bad. Is that what you think? That's not it, Billy. Your mom loves you very much, and the reason she left doesn't have anything to do with you. Kramer vs. Kramer begins with a fracture, a mother who can no longer stand to stay with a father, that unravels before us, pulls taut, and then threatens to tear at that which is caught in the middle, their son. An acting powerhouse and a dynamo of familiar depression for children of divorce and audiences everywhere, the film neither pulls its punches nor does it cast its own judgment. It merely documents something broken that didn't used to be, giving equal weight to the effect each member in the family has on the other two, and to the effect that each pair's relationship relationship has on the excluded third. Never has there been a more thorough or more devastating dissection of a family trio. One member larger still, and you get the perfect nuclear family, and subject of countless cinematic examinations. An order of magnitude more complex than the three-part family, you've got sibling rivalry affecting parental favoritism, affecting marital bliss, affecting family cohesion. You've got parent traps and disastrous weddings and difficulties integrating and language barriers. The Adams Family and Easy A show us surprisingly healthy four-person dynamics. Boyhood tracks the evolution of a family unit over a decade of real time. Waves dramatizes the interconnectedness of a downward spiral, the squid and the whale takes divorce's effect on the nuclear unit to a wonderfully weird place, while force majeure tracks resentment across a much narrower time frame. However, for our number four pick, our favorite four-member family dynamic actually has three. That is to say, it explores what happens to a four-person system when one of its members tragically and suddenly dies. Where the system still very much depends on them and the role they play, they're just no longer around to play it. Explored fascinatingly in films like Hereditary, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Stand By Me, and our pick, Ordinary People. Well, I want to take a picture of Connie and his mother. Uh, no, I'll tell you what, let's get the three men in there and I'll take a picture of you. Connie, move in a little closer to your mother, okay? Prize winner. Yeah, that's great. Portrait. That is great. Do it. Page one, Lake Forester. Isn't it, Mother? Yes, it's yeah, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Sure didn't come. Calvin. Hold it. Connie, smile. Calvin. Just a second, smile. Calvin, give me the camera. No, I didn't get it yet, Beth. Come on, give me the camera. Dad, give me the camera. Not until I get a picture of the two of you. Cal. Hang on a second. Give me the goddamn camera! Just in case Kramer vs. Kramer doesn't get you down deep enough, you might try on Robert Redford's directorial debut to really send you into a spiral before the holidays. The story starts with a family attempting to tread water in the aftermath of one child's death and the surviving child's subsequent attempted suicide. That's where the movie starts. 
The film makes for a stark examination of siblinghood not just in a vacuum, a la Mustang, but within the context of parental love, all brought to a boil in the face of extreme grief. It explores what it's like to be a child trying to impress a pair of parents not just on your own, but alongside someone else doing the same thing, with all the inevitable hurt that can come with having a constant point of comparison. And when that system, in equilibrium if not good health, is suddenly destabilized by a death, we watch as everyone left behind grapples with the inadequacies and unfairness revealed by the loss. Of course, not all families fit the standard nuclear mold. Mom, dad, and two and a half kids. Some of them take their own unique form. From the blended family of step relations like those in Step Brothers and The Sound of Music, to the adoptive families, both official and unofficial, of Lion, Secrets and Lies, Hunt for the Wilder People, Spring, Summer, Fall, Winter and Spring, The Kid, and Elf, there are great films about primary relationships between children and non-parents like Roma, Ida, and Come On, Come On and, increasingly but still rarely, films about families with queer parents. We recommend The Kids Are Alright, Ideal Home, Patrick, Age One and a Half, and for our number three pick, a merciful end to our misery streak on this list, with The Birdcage. Oh, I'm having such a wonderful time. This is just what I've always dreamed of. A big, loving family gathered around the table, just the way it was when I was a girl. Yes, that's the way we grew up, too. <gasps> oh. It was a wonderful world then, wasn't it? Happy families and everyone speaking English and no drugs and no AIDS. Easy on the wine. <laughs> A ferocious farce by Mike Nichols to lighten the mood going into our home stretch, The Birdcage, an adaptation of a French film with the same name, but in French, finds an adult son preparing to introduce his parents to his in-laws-to-be, except it's the 90s. His in-laws are ultra-conservative, and his parents are Robin Williams and Nathan Lane, which is to say they are two gay dads. So they do what any gay dads in the 90s would do and put drag to use in service of heteronormativity and pretend to be a regular old straight couple. And it works, on so many levels. It's a hilariously non-traditional family masquerading as an even more hilariously traditional family. It's a touching portrait of the pain parents subject themselves to on behalf of their children, and the kind of hurt a child can inflict upon them by insisting that they conform, especially in a culture that conspires to demand the same. It's also a fascinating look at the concepts of validity, acceptance, and erasure in non-traditional family units, culminating in an extremely rewarding cinematic reversal. Dressed in drag and set to Sister Sledges, we are family. With more than four family members, things get exponentially more complicated in a rapidly expanding web of relationships and dynamics and potential conflicts, as anyone who's ever had to share the dinner table with multiple siblings likely well knows. And while Little Women, Fiddler on the Roof, and Home Alone manage to keep things pretty healthy despite losing the occasional child, things aren't nearly so smooth in films like The Meyerowitz Stories, King Richard, Captain Fantastic, or Cretia. We love the amazingly choreographed emotional chaos of Welcome to the Dollhouse, Dog Tooth, and A Woman Under the Influence, but for our pick, it's hard to get much more emotionally chaotic than Festive. Uh, men allerførst vil jeg gerne holde en lille tale. Uh, jeg har spillet to taler. Bare. En er grøn og en er gul, og du kan selv vælge, hvad for en det skal være. Den ene er grøn, den anden er gul. Jeg tager det her grøn. Den grønne er det interessant valg, må man sige. Det er en slags sandhedstale. Og jeg har valgt at kalde den, når far skulle i bad. The first of the Danish Dogma 95 movement, which mandated extremely low-budget filmmaking techniques, Festen, or The Celebration, uses those low-budget techniques to tell an extraordinarily dark story of a son who, in a speech on the occasion of his father's 60th birthday, delivers an accusation of sexual abuse as if it were just another funny anecdote. And it is with exactly that level of deadpan and darkness of humor that the single act of truth-telling purposefully delivered with all the weight of an offhand remark sets everything off unraveling. Multiple lifetimes of trauma embedded deeply within a large family system, long ignored or denied or tolerated or excused, are exposed to sunlight and within less than a day, they rip the entire rotten thing to threads. While a lot of this list has been pretty far from what you might call the quote-unquote model family, none have been quite so f***ed up as this. To paraphrase Tolstoy, if every happy family is alike and every unhappy family is unique, there are no uniquer families than the one from Festin. 
For our final stop on this list, we've saved our number one slot for those families that are bigger than big. Spanning left, right, up, and down the family tree across multiple generations, finding opportunities to explore how family dynamics don't just interrelate, but are inherited and passed along from one era to the next. From the wholesome and fruitful family trees of Coco and the Farewell, to the toxic and gnarled ones of Knives Out and August Osage County, to the delightfully bizarre shaped branches of Little Miss Sunshine and the Royal Tenenbaums. We love Shoplifters, On Golden Pond, Soul Food, and definitely Yee Yee. However, for our top slot here, we don't think there has been a better on-screen family portrait ever made than Ingmar Bergman's sprawling epic of intimacy, Fanny and Alexander. Kära vänner, nu skulle jag ha lust att hålla tal. Bravo! Men det tänker jag inte göra. As always, when we pick Fanny and Alexander, which we realize is starting to become frequent enough that the mirror might start to get jealous, we do so with an asterisk next to it to clarify that we are referring not to the measly skeletal three-hour theatrical cut, but to the wonderfully beefy five-hour TV cut that lays out for us the entire Ekdal family story in all its splendor and still leaves us wanting more. Fanny and Alexander truly has it all. Love, resentment, envy, empathy, death, birth, marriages, affairs, evil step-parents, benevolent matriarchs, cousins you just can't take anywhere, that one uncle, and that other uncle too. And while none of it could work without the mastery and honesty of Ingmar Bergman operating at the peak of his craft, truly one of the best ever to wield a camera, it really is the size of the thing that makes it. There's no simple, true story about big families. The only way to get there, honestly, is with scale. And there are perhaps no better moments amidst Fanny and Alexander's 300 plus minutes of runtime than those during the two feasts that bookend it, where the entire extended Ekdal clan gathers into a single room for what is so clearly a rare and fleeting moment in this world. A moment to be together with your family and together with them at the same time, which is why we think the Ekdals are one of film's best families of all time. So, what do you think? Disagree with any of our picks? Do we leave out any of your favorite cinematic families? It's Eddie Murphy as the clumps, isn't it? He's just all the clumps. Well, if it's not the clumps, you better let us know in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more Cinefix movie lists.